and welcome to day two of our workshop. We've got a pretty full program today, and our uh, first speaker is Alan Henke, who will talk to us on fusion systems, locality, and the classification of finite simple groups. Welcome, yeah, thank you very much. And thank you very much for the opportunity to speak here at this conference in, on, in honor of two very distinguished mathematicians. So standing here is both very exciting and very scary. And the same thing could actually be said about working in an area where Michael Aschbacher works as well and writes papers at such an enormous speed. Oh, it's, he said it's on, but. Yeah, turn it back on. Hello? It is on? Okay. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, good. Um, yeah, so basically, my strategy of dealing with this is to work on something which is closely related to Aschbacher's program, but try a slightly different approach. And this is what this talk is about. But I want to start with some introduction. So firstly, I want to attempt to summarize the proof of the classification of finite simple groups in about two minutes. I apologize in advance. So basically we look at the P local subgroups and this is just a fancy name for the normalizer of a non-trivial P subgroup. And the classification works basically by finding some information about the P local subgroups, mainly for the prime P equals two and use this then to determine the structure of a group. So what should be noted here is that by the theorem of Phi Thompson, if we take a non-abelian finite simple group, then the order is even, so we can always find some two local subgroups. And looking at the two local subgroups then also leads to the major case distinction in the proof. So except if G is small, so has two rank less than or equal to four, we have two main cases to consider. And what one thinks, so either G is of component type or of characteristic P type. And these um, abstract definitions actually mirror what we see in the generic examples for finite simple groups, which are the groups of Li type. And if you look at groups of component type, that's meant to mirror what we see in groups of Li type and odd characteristic. So these are groups where there exists an involution such that the centralizer modulo, modulo and odd order normal subgroup has a component. And groups of characteristic two type mirror what we see in groups of lead type and character, defining characteristic two. So for every two local subgroup, we have this property here where O2 of M stands for the largest normal two subgroup. Okay, so by, if you look at groups of component type, we have to deal with, with these odd order normal subgroups. So they don't occur if you have this condition here. And this actually leads often to some problems in the proof of the classification. And now working with fusion systems is a conceptual way to circumvent these problems. So fusion systems are now the next thing I want to talk about. So fusion in groups was something which was considered already for quite a while. Fusion just means conjugacy of P subgroups. More precisely, if we take two P subgroups, P and Q of G, when we consider the conjugation maps, which are induced by an appropriate element of G, so one which conjugates P into Q. And actually by Sulu's theorem, every P subgroup is conjugate into a pseudo subgroup. And that means that for many purposes, we can just restrict attention to the subgroups of a given pseudo P subgroup S. And then one can basically encode the information about the fusion in the category. So this works for any P subgroup S of G, but usually we want it to be a pseudo P subgroup. And then we write FS of G for the following category. The objects are just all the subgroups of S. And then as morphism sets, we just take the set of these conjugation homomorphisms, which are induced by an appropriate element of G. And the set is also often written as form G from P to Q. 
So one thing that should be observed here is that the normalizer in G of P modulo the centralizer in G of P can actually be seen in this category as the automorphism group of P. So basically, the fusion system of a finite group contains a lot of information about the P local subgroups. The other way around, the classical theorem of Alperin says that if you know the P local subgroups, then you also know the fusion. So this is very similar kind of information, but in the fusion system, we have sort of a bit less information. Okay, so there's also a notion of an abstract fusion system, and this is generalizing what we just saw in this example. So again, now S is just some P group. And again, it's a category whose objects are all the subgroups of this P group S. And the morphisms look similarly as before. So first of all, they are all injective group homomorphisms. Then we include the conjugation homomorphisms by elements of S. Yeah, so we still have these. And then we have a technical axiom if we have a morphism in F from P to Q then we can restrict the target and get something bijective, take the inverse, and these are still morphisms in F. Okay, so these are some relatively weak axioms. One usually wants some stronger axioms to hold, and this is then what we call saturated fusion systems. So I think more enlightening when seeing the actual definition is to see the examples. So if S is any P group, then you have P subgroup of G, then you have probably observed already that this fusion system FS of G is actually a fusion system and it deserves the name. And if S is a pseudo P subgroup of G, then FS of G is saturated. So our main examples for saturated fusion systems are these ones. So actually it does, I mean, up to a suitable notion of isomorphism, FS of G does not depend on the choice of the pseudo P subgroup. So we often just call this a P fusion system of G. So there are saturated fusion systems which do not occur in this way, and we call them exotic. At odd primes, there are relatively many exotic fusion systems known at the prime two. There is only one family of fusion systems, which is in a well-defined way simple. And these are the Benson-Solomon fusion system. So this is a family of fusion systems which is closely related to spin seven of Q. And the general goal in this area is to get a better understanding of how exotic fusion systems arise and how plentiful they are. So far, it seems that most saturated fusion systems are not exotic. But the search for exotic fusion system and trying to get an understanding where they arise also motivates the classification of saturated fusion systems in some special cases. Another motivation, at least at the prime two, is that we want to get a new proof of the classification of finite simple groups, but I say more about that later on. So for now, I want to say that basically we can do a lot of things in fusion systems which we are used to doing in groups. So there are many concepts which we can use. So <clears throat> firstly, if F is a saturated fusion system on S, then or if F is actually just a fusion system on S, then there is a natural notion of subsystems. So that's just a subcategory was, which is a fusion system over some subgroup of S. And usually we are interested in subsystems which are saturated. And that's actually often hard to find. So that is one of the difficulties if one wants to make constructions. So we have notions of normalizers and centralizers if we consider subgroups of S. So if P is a subgroup of S, then the normalizer in F of P is a certain subsystem on the normalizer in S of P. Similarly, the centralizer is a certain subsystem on the centralizer in S of P. So to look at the example again, we basically get this um, fusion system if F is the fusion system of a group just as the fusion system of the normalizer and the centralizer respectively. And what you can observe here, so in the case of a normalizer, if a normalizer in S of P is a pseudo P subgroup of a normalizer in G of P, then this will be a saturated fusion system. And same here, if a centralizer in S of P is a pseudo P subgroup of a centralizer in G of P, we get something saturated. Of course, this doesn't have to be always the case. 
but if S is the pseudo P subgroup, then we can choose P suitably up to conjugation so that this happens. And so that way we get then saturated fusion systems. And this is also what is possible in the abstract. So by a conjugate, I mean now an F isomorphic object. Uh, and if then a subgroup P of S is suitably chosen up to conjugation, then the normalizer and the centralizer are saturated. So this is one point where it's a little bit more difficult to work with fusion systems than in groups, but basically we can still work with P local subgroups or P local subsystems. So, and if you define that, you actually want to consider the normalizers of non-trivial subgroups, which are saturated. So just to give an overview of some concepts, which we also can consider in fusion systems, this is not an exhaustive list, but for example, there are normal subsystems defined and the notion we use nowadays is due to Aschbacher. This leads also to a natural notion of subnormal subsystems. Then of course, also to a natural notion of simple fusion systems. And what's slightly more difficult is to define quasi simple fusion systems, but also this can be done. And then Aschbacher developed a theory of components and the components form a central product, which is a normal subsystem. So we get a notion of a layer E of F and also of a generalized fitting subsystem F star of F. So these are all things we can do. Looking at centralizers of subsystems is actually quite difficult in general, but Aschbacher defines centralizers of normal subsystems and of components. And I was able to generalize this to define centralizers of subnormal subsystems. Actually, this uses the theory of localities I'm going to talk about later on. So this is by far not an exhaustive list of what you can do in fusion systems, but I should warn you in general that many constructions are actually quite difficult in fusion systems. And one particular problem in what I'm going to talk about later is that centralizers of components of evolution centralizers are not necessarily defined. Yeah? So centralizers of components of a whole fusion system are defined, but if we look at the component of an evolution centralizer, we don't necessarily have the centralizer defined. Okay, so here is Aschbacher's program uh, stated in very rough terms. So in the first step, instead of classifying or saying something about the two local subs subgroups, we want to classify simple saturated fusion systems over two groups and then use this in the second step to prove a classification of finite simple groups. Okay, of course, this is in very rough terms. So the focus of Aschbacher's program is actually on component type and actually on groups of component type and actually on um, a particular portion of this. And I think Aschbacher will probably explain this to us in more detail this afternoon. Um, so one would actually classify certain fusion systems of component type in the first step. Um, so there's actually a very natural definition of fusion systems of component type, and it's even in some sense easier than in groups. So a group is of component type if there is a saturated centralizer of an involution, which has a component. Yeah, so we don't have to care about what order normal subgroups and fusion systems. And that's actually the main example, uh, the main um, advantage in particular, if you look at the classification of finite simple groups of component type. So we can avoid these te technical difficulties which are caused by these odd order normal subgroups of two local subgroups. And why can we do that? So the basic uh, result here is this lemma. So if you have an odd order normal subgroup, then quotioning it out doesn't change the two fusion system or more generally, if we quotient out a normal subgroup of order prime to be, then it will not change the P fusion system. Okay, so you will, will not be surprised to hear that Aschbacher proved already many, many, many classification theorems for fusion systems of component type. So some other theorems were proved by Justin Lind, by Lind and Rainbolt, and also by Justin Lind and myself. Um, so this completes at least most of step one, and I think Aschbacher will give us an update on that this afternoon. 
Uh, I just want to say a little bit more about the work I've been involved with, with Justin Lind. So what we do is we consider fusion systems where the centralizer of an involution has a component, which is one of these exotic Benson Solomon fusion systems. And this is particular interesting case because it did not appear in that sense in the classification of finite simple groups. Actually, it was also a case where one perhaps could have hoped to find a new simple fusion system, but actually there wasn't any. So that gives now some relatively strong evidence that the Benson-Solomon fusion systems are actually the only exotic fusion systems as at the prime too. Then I also want to mention some progress on the second step of Aschbacher's program, which was made by my former PhD student, Julian Kafczyk, who is also sitting here. So he classified simple groups with two fusion systems isomorphic to PSL and Q, where Q is odd. Basically, this gives the characterization of these groups, PSL and Q, and also of PSU and Q. Okay, but what I mainly want to talk about today is I want to explain an attempt at basically revising the revision project by Michael Aschbacher. So um, I want to simplify the classification of two fusion systems of component type by using some new con concepts. Um, so I should say that we are not actually yet at the stage where we can, where we have proved classification theorems using our new framework, but the progress is at the moment purely on a conceptual level. So the main idea is to work with locality associated to saturated fusion systems. And localities are group-like structures, which were introduced by Andrew Andy Chemak based on earlier work of Broto Levy and Oliver. And the original motivation to study these concepts comes from homotopy theory, but I think they are also very useful just algebraically. To say just a little bit about more, more about this. So Broto Levy and Oliver defined centric linking systems associated to saturated fusion systems. And they can be kind of seen as some algebraic models for p-completed classifying spaces of affine groups in the sense that if you look at the p-fusion system of a finite group, then the p-completed nerve of the centric linking system will just be the p-completed classifying space of the group. And um, this leads more generally to a notion of p-completed classifying space of fusion systems. So what we need for that is that there is a unique centric linking system associated to every saturated fusion system. This was a long standing conjecture, which was finally proved by Andy Chemak in 2011. And he used the language of localities and introduced it in that con context. And I'm going to introduce it later in this talk. So don't worry. Um, it should be said that using certain ideas from Chemak's proof, Bob Oliver gave an alternative proof which actually doesn't use localities anymore. Both proofs depend originally on the classification of finite simple groups, but in a very structural way. And that made it possible for Glaubermann and Lind to remove it dependence. So we know now that these centric linking systems exist and are unique. And um, yeah, in that way, we also know that certain localities exist and are unique. And this is what I want to use and working with fusion systems. Okay, so the next thing I want to introduce are basically localities, but they are special cases of partial groups. So I'm going to start with that. So if we think of a group, we could also think of it as a group with a multivariable product. So we have a product defined on every word in the set, which we usually call G. Yeah? And now I, in a partial group, is a set L together with a set D of words in L on which a product is defined. And the product is denoted by pi. So that's a map from D to L. And it's a kind of partial multivariable product. And then there's also an involutory bijection, which should be thought of as the inversion. And then, of course, we want certain axioms to hold, which resemble the group's axioms. So there's some notion of associativity then the axioms also imply that the empty word, which I denote by the empty set symbol, is in D. So in particular, we can form pi of 
the empty word. And this is what we call usually one and behaves as a neutral element. And then of course, inverses are also in some sense well behaved. So they behave as inverses should behave. So the first example which comes to mind is of course a group. So if you take a group, then it is a partial group where the product is defined on all words. Okay, if this were the only examples, of course, that would not be very interesting. So we are interested in this mainly because there are some examples which also contain a lot of information about P local subgroups of finite groups. So this is the example I want to introduce next. Let G be a finite group and S a solo P subgroup. Then we consider a set delta of subgroups of S, which is closed under passing to G conjugates and overgroups in S. So that's just a technical condition. And now what is the underlying set of the locality or of the partial group we want to construct? So we take all the elements G and G, which conjugate some element of delta into S. And or I could also say conjugate some element of delta to another element of delta. So this is the underlying set. And then I have to say on what um, set of words I define the product. And I do a similar thing. I take all the words G1 up to Gn such that I success successively conjugate some elements of delta. And then as a partial product, um, yeah, I just take the restriction of a product on G and this actually works. And as the inversion, I just take the restriction of the inversion map. And this gives me a nice example of a partial group. So this is actually also an example of a locality which I will introduce later. So before I get to that, I want to introduce some basic definitions in partial groups. So what I like about partial groups so much in comparison to fusion systems is that it's very natural to define at least the very basic concepts. So just some piece of notation, I write always W of L for the set of words in L. So if L is a partial group with such a product pi from D to L, then D will be a subset of W of L. And now there's a natural notion of partial subgroups. So with, this is a subset, which first of all should be closed under, conjugate, uh, under taking inverses. And then it also should be closed under taking product in the sense that if I take a word in H and the product is defined, so it lies in D, then also the product is in H. So this set of words in H intersect D contains the empty word. So that means also that pi of the empty word, which is our identity is an H. So in particular, it's non-empty. Now, um, if the product is defined on all words in H, then actually this becomes a group. In general, it's just a partial group again, with the restriction of pi to W of H intersect D. And then we call it a subgroup if it is actually a group. So in particular, we have an natural notion of P subgroups. So we take actual subgroups and call them a P subgroup if the order is a power of P. There's also a natural notion of conjugation, but conjugation is of course not always defined because the product is not always defined. But if G inverse XG is in D, then we can naturally define the conjugate like that. And similarly, as we do it in groups, we can also then conjugate subsets provided, um, of course, this is all defined. And if I write such a thing, I usually mean implicitly that it is defined. Okay, and now I can give you the definition of a locality. So a locality is actually a triple L delta S such that L is a finite partial group. So it's a partial group and the underlying set L is finite. 
And S is maximal among all the PSAP groups of S. So it's kind of a pseudo PSAP group. Um, then I have this technical condition, which I had also before in the example in similar way that uh, the set delta is a set of subgroups of S and it's closed under passing to L conjugates and overgroups in S. And then similarly as in the example before, I can basically control the domain of a product by looking at conjugation of elements of delta. So localities actually um, can be used to construct some categories which for special kinds of localities belong, uh, correspond to linking systems. And delta would then be the object set of this category. And this is why one also calls this the object set of L delta S. So if we take any subgroup of S or any subset of L actually, then we can always in a natural way define the normalizer on L of P. We just take all the elements such that the conjugate of P under G is defined and it's equal to P. And if P is now an object in delta, then one can observe, first of all, because of this last axiom, that all the words in the normalizer in L of P are in D. Yeah? And with a little bit more thinking, one sees actually that it is a subgroup. So we find all these nice finite groups sitting inside of a locality. So this is already kind of a P local subgroup, but we cannot do it for all subgroups of S. So I say more about that later, what happens then. Okay. Just one more general concept I want to introduce. So there's also a natural generalization of normal subgroups. So we call this a partial normal subgroup. This is a partial subgroup such that um, whenever, so N is called a partial normal subgroup, such that whenever I take an element in N and an element in F, and the conjugate of N under F is defined, then it's actually also in N. And I also denote it as I would do it for groups with a symbol. And of course, this leads again to a natural notion of partial subnormal subgroups. So for localities, and this works only for localities and not for partial groups in general, anti chemark developed a nice theory. So there's a natural notion of homomorphisms of partial groups. And the kernel is always a partial normal subgroups, subgroup. And in the case of localities, uh, Andy showed that there are something like a quotient locality and the kernels of homomorphisms are in this, uh, with this become then exactly the kernels of uh, exactly the partial normal subgroups. So as we are used from groups. And this is, by the way, something which does not work the same way in fusion systems. So speaking about fusion systems, if L delta S is a locality, then there is naturally a fusion system defined. So we have conjugation naturally defined and we can look at conjugation element uh, conjugation homomorphisms between subgroups of S. And then we take the fusion system, which is generated by that. And we can do this more generally if H is just some partial subgroup of L, then we can define a fusion system over S intersect H in a natural way. And we say that L delta S is a locality over F if F is just F S of L. Okay, so now I want to look at localities, which in some sense correspond to linking systems, and I call this linking localities. So these are localities, first of all, where FS of L is saturated. So in general, it's not clear that it is, but we impose this here. And then I want the set delta in some sense to be large enough. And then I want the normalizer in L of P, which I just said is a nice finite group. I want this to have this property, which we saw already in the definition of groups of characteristic two type. Oops, what did I do here? Ah, no. Okay. And now, um, actually, these linking localities always exist. And this basically follows from the existence and uniqueness of centric linking systems. 
So if delta is a set of subgroups of S, which is appropriate in some sense, that one can possibly hope to get a, a look, linking locality, then there exists actually an essentially unique linking locality. And the existence and uniqueness of centric linking system is in some sense a special case of this statement. So delta is one of these, uh, the set of F-centric subgroups is one of these appropriate sets delta. And so there exists unique linking locality with this set of F-centric subgroups, which I didn't define, but this is a object set of a linking system. And so that would be. Um, appropriate means, so it, um, it satisfies some necessary conditions, which right. such an op so it's yeah. ah okay yeah because I didn't don't state it very precisely but it is it is actually there is a precise statement and it is proven here yeah. <laughs> yeah. okay yeah and then there's always a unique largest linking locality attached to this I call this a subcentric locality. And there's a set of subgroups of S with F subcentric subgroups, which I can one can just defer, define in terms of F. And usually we want to work with some nice linking localities, and one ch nice choice in many cases is the subcentric locality. And I will talk an about another nice choice later on. So um, given any linking locality, we actually get some nice correspondences between fusion systems and linking localities. So in particular, if you look at the partial normal subgroups and the normal subsystems, then we get a one-to-one -one correspondence, which um, at least for large enough delta is also given in this very natural way. So in building on this, um, Andy Chemark and I prove further translation results. So in particular, there is a natural notion of simple and quasi-simple linking localities. And these correspond precisely to the notions of simple and quasi-simple fusion systems. And I talk about some further one-to-one -one correspondences along the way later on. So, and actually, while doing this, we also revisit many results on fusion systems that form the conceptual basis for Ashbacher's program. So, in some cases, we get really much simpler proofs. And it also helps to prove some new theorems about fusion systems, which might in itself be useful if one wants to get simplifications in Ashbacher's program. So one thing I want to briefly mention is that if you work with localities or with partial groups in general, we sometimes want to consider partial groups which kind of sit inside of this partial group, but which are not partial subgroups. So the main reason why this um, makes sense is that we have some flexibility in choosing this domain of a product. So there's this formal definition here. So basically, we take a subset H, and then we take a subset D0, which is the domain of the product and sits inside of W of H and D. And then we want H together with a restriction of a product pi to D0 and the restriction of an inversion map to be a partial group. So for this to work, we need that pi applied to any element of D0 is actually again an H, and H is closed under inverses. Okay, and this actually turns up in mathematical wilderness. So if L delta is a subcentric locality, I said that it is the largest linking locality. And this means more precisely that any other linking locality over F up to isomorphism is an impartial subgroup of L. So where does this name impartial subgroup come from? It is quite a charming name which Andy Chemak introduced and Basically, these impartial subgroups can be seen as the images of homomorphisms of partial groups, and this is where the name comes from. <laughs> okay, these impartial subgroups also play a role if we want to look at something like p-local sublocalities. But first of all, I want to say for every subgroup p of s, and actually every locality, so not only for linking localities, we can look at normalizers and centralizers, which are naturally defined. And 
these are actually partial subgroups. But for many purposes, this is actually not good enough. We want to find something which is actually a locality and uh, actually a linking locality. And if you look at subcentric localities, then we can do something in that direction. So we then find impartial subgroups, which I denote by this um, Bobaki N and Bobaki C, um, which has nothing to do with the numbers. It's just a way of getting new notation. And they sit inside of this usual normalizer and centralizer and are impartial subgroups, which can be given the structure of subcentric localities over these fusion systems we want to consider. And well, again, we have to choose P suitably such that the fusion system normalizer and centralizer are saturated. Okay, but basically with subcentric localities, we can work with something like P local sublocalities. Okay, subcentric localities are, however, not that nice for everything. At least if you want to look at subnormal structures, then regular localities, which were introduced by Chemark, are nicer to work with. So these are just some kinds of linking localities, which I'm not defining. But the main property is that if we have a partial subnormal subgroup, then it can be given the structure of a regular locality. And now we have a natural notion of um, quasi simple linking localities. And this means also that we get that we can say that um, a partial subnormal subgroup is quasi simple. And this gives us then a natural definition of a component. So we get a natural notion of components of regular localities. And this we get also a nice theory as we get it for groups. We get the definition of a layer. And there's a notion of a generalized fitting subgroup. And I revisited and mildly extended this in a preprint last year. OK, this was quite a lot. And I see already some people fall asleep. So um, I try to summarize the information I gave you in the table. So we have analogs of group theoretic concepts. And I want to say what we have in these three set settings. So we have on the one hand the fusion systems, then we have the regular localities, and then we have the subcentric locality. Okay, so we have analogs of normal subgroups for fusion systems. These are just the normal subsystems for regular localities and subcentric localities. These are just the partial normal subgroups. And by this theorem, I proved together with Andy Chemark, we get one to one correspondences between everything here. Okay. Then in all three settings, we also have natural notions of subnormal substructures. Then we have natural notions of simple and quasi-simple fusion systems, regular localities, and subcentric localities. Then actually in all three settings, we have notions of F star of G and E of G. Um, for com components, I've introduced so far for fusion systems and regular localities. I say more about subcentric localities later on. Then we have analogs of P local subgroups and fusion systems. We have them in subcentric localities, but I was disappointed to find that probably no such thing exists in regular localities, or at least I don't see any systematic way of constructing it. And just to stress this, the same holds for involution centralizers, which we would be particularly interested in in Aschbacher's program. So basically, I've given up hope that we can do everything in regular localities, which we can do in fusion systems. But I have not given up hope that we can do everything in subcentric localities. And um, together with Valentina Grazian, we showed that there is actually a theory of components of subcentric localities. And that means we can do everything in fusion system uh, in, in the subcentric localities, which we can also do in fusion systems. And I think we can also do more. And this is, of course, the purpose of the whole exercise. So I chose a lighter shade of green here because components in subcentric localities are not quite as nice as components in regular localities. But we can always find a regular locality that sits inside of the subcentric localities. And we get one to one correspondences here. And that's why I can think we, overall we can work with this quite nicely. 
so what is the problem here perhaps um so i try to indicate this by some arrows so when i said we have analogs of subnormal subgroups in all settings that is true but we only get a nice one-to-one -one correspondence if you look at fusion systems versus regular localities so this is again something i proved together with andy chemark so if you look at regular localities versus subcentric localities, we get some natural map from the partial normal subgroups of a subcentric locality to the partial normal subgroups of a regular locality. But at the moment, um, I don't know whether it's injective or surjective. So my guess at the moment is that it is surjective, but not necessarily injective. But perhaps that's also not that important. So um, we actually get on the level of components, we get one-to-one -one correspondences and this should be the main thing for us to work with. Okay, so I said I'm hoping that we can do actually more in subcentric localities than we can do in fusion systems, and this is the purpose of the whole exercise. So I want to say why I think uh, this is the case, and for that I want to start by briefly summarizing some part of the classification of finite simple groups again. So there's a so-called pump-up lemma for groups, and this is used basically if you look at a component of an involution tantalizer to move to a larger component of an involution tantalizer in some way, um, if there is a larger one. But of course, at some point, we will arrive at a maximal component of an involution tantalizer. So when I talk about a maximal component, this refers to a component of an involution tantalizer and not of the actual group. And, okay, sorry, I'm not going to make this more precise. And Ashbacher's component theorem says that, that in a finite simple group G, except in some small exceptional cases, and except if this maximal component is uh, a component of a whole group, um, it is a standard component. And again, I'm not going to tell you precisely what that is, but this means basically that the centralizer of this component is very restricted. And then this is used to solve standard form problems. This means, so if in an inductive proof of a classification of finite simple groups, we can assume that we know the possibilities for the quasi simple group K, and then one moves through it case by case and determines the structure of the G from this. Okay, so perhaps you see the problem now already if you want to do the same thing in fusion systems. So we have trouble defining centralizers of components of involution centralizers. And that is the problem. So Ashbacher proved a pump up lemma for fusion systems and this leads to a nice notion of maximal components. But formulating the component theorem is difficult or actually in general impossible. Ashbacher has proved some component theorems, plural. Um, which work in certain situation, but it does require a lot of case distinction and also at the end a lot of going into the structure of groups at places where I think it should actually not be necessary and should have something more conceptual in place there. And I actually hope that such a conceptual approach can be found using subcentric localities. So um, we have not Right, work that out in detail yet, but I think we can prove a pump up lemma for subcentric localities. And then the advantage is that it is a lot easier to look at centralizers of components of involution centralizers. And here things are actually different than in fusion systems. And one would work, one really would want to stay in the framework of localities. So just to give you some idea why one has more information in the locality case. So if you look at a fixed involution centralizer in L, meaning one of these subcentric p-local, um, sub, so p-local sub-localities as I like to call them, and as a fixed component of an involution centralizer of the same involution in F and in the corresponding subcentric locality, then we get a one-to-one -one correspondence between the components. But now if you look at all involution centralizers of L and the components and all involution centralizers of F and the components of that, then actually we just get a map 
from the set of components of involution centralizers of L to the corresponding set of, corresp of components of involution centralizers in F. And this is surjective, but in some cases not injective. So I hope this gives you some idea that on the level of subcentric localities, we have a bit more information. So, and I think this explains why it should be easier to define centralizers of such local components. So in a saturated fusion system, if you look at this component of an involution centralizer, then not even the centralizer in S is defined in general. So there are cases where one can see that there's actually no sensible definition. Whereas in localities in general, this is super easy because one can show that the P subgroup S acts on L via conjugation. So the conjugate of an element of L by an element of S is always defined. And this gives you just an action in the normal sense. So we have a centralizer in S of K defined, and it's a subgroup of S immediately for any subset. So in particular, for any local component. So that's already some advantage before we even have done some actual work. And um, yeah, I've written some theorem on scratch paper. I still think it is true, but perhaps you should take it with a grain of salt. So, um, so given a subcentric locality and a component K of an involution centralizer, or as we also do in fusion systems, sometimes we actually want to take some conjugates of such components, which has to do with the fact that not all um, centralizers of involution in the fusion system are saturated. So we want to move to conjugates and we want to do then the same on the level of components of involution centralizers. Okay, and then I assume that there exists, I mean, I assume this technical condition, which perhaps you don't want to read in detail, but um, it is a condition which one could assume in the a relevant case of a standard component theorem. And if this holds, then I can show that there exists some kind of centralizer of K, which is a linking locality. I actually think it might be a subcentric locality, but I'm not quite sure yet. It is definitely a linking locality. In particular, the corresponding fusion system is saturated. And it sits inside of a centralizer in L of K, which is naturally defined. And well, I hope that this gives some way of formulating and proving a standard component theorem for linking uh, for subcentric localities. But of course, there's still a lot of hard work to do to actually do that. And then I'm at the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ellen. An amazing <laughs> exposition. Are there any comments or questions? Yeah. Yes. Rada. One is very quick. So would that mean that that would also give you as a byproduct of this story? Um yeah, step one, I mean actually the portion which Ashbacher aims to do. Yeah. So it's not a classification okay. of all simple. Two fusion system. Oh. Yeah. Do you have rather different methods in order to achieve the same thing in your framework? Um, yeah, as I said, I think the centralizer part is the one which is actually a lot easier. I mean, I'm I'm not saying that one should really redo everything Ashbacher did. So I think there are also cases where the fusion system language is actually very natural. Um, and there are some parts where I could not tell at the moment whether one could, I mean, whether it is plausible to get some improvements or not. So, yeah. <laughs> Are there any further questions, comments? Yes. And uh, what are the difficulties uh, in, in defining the uh, Yeah, perhaps if I go back. Um, 
Yeah, so I think the difficulty is actually that we don't want to look at all partial subnormal subgroup of the subcentric localities because they are very difficult to control. So, and I mean, I have not really found a counter example, but I think probably they don't correspond to subnormal subsystems or fusion systems. Um, yeah, and that makes it quite difficult. So, perhaps, so we work usually with some regular locality L delta, which sits inside of the subcentric locality L. And then we can look at a component K delta here. And then we take what is generated by K delta and show then that this is a normal subgroup of E of L and therefore subnormal. And uh, yeah, I think this is basically what one should take as a component and we get a map in the other direction just by intersecting. Yeah. But things are a little bit technical and difficult here, but I think it pays out at the end. Thank you. Let's let's thank Ellen again uh, for a lovely talk. Have about an eight minute break.
Is your speaker virtually just, he's just arrived right. and he said he's going to use chalk? Now, what does that mean as far as okay. this goes? So that's fine. So I will just point the cameras at the board. So um, when it's recording the streaming, uh, everyone on your Zoom can watch him use the board. Fantastic. So I'm just going to. Uh, yeah. Um, I will just. Um, sorry, hello. Are you just using the chalk? Chalk. Okay, yeah. that's great. Oh, great. not working. It did work when Peter did that before, but I don't know. Okay, I'm just going to stop.